like to welcome everyone to ChessLecture.com. I'm International Master William Pascal, and it's my pleasure to kick off a new series I've created here exclusively for our site, Great Masters in Chess History. Every installment of this lecture series, I'm going to be featuring a different great master from the past, and I'm going to kick it off with one of my favorites, Salo Floor. Um, the Czech Grandmaster was what I would classify as a very aggressive positional player. His games illustrate both tremendous positional and tactical understanding, with I think the emphasis being on the positional part. Many contributions to opening theory, including the floor meekness variation of the English, which begins after C4, knight to f6, knight to c3, e6, and e4. Very aggressive system, characteristic of his style. Particular openings Floor was expert in include the English opening, many, many queen pawn systems with white, very flexible, and with black, especially the Karo Khan. Today we're going to look at one of his impressive games with the white pieces. This was played in 1947, and his opponent was the very, very strong Russian player Simagin. Okay, so Flor Simagin, 1947, D4. Although Flor did have a love for the English opening, I think his queen pawn game is so strong it could be a model for anyone wishing to learn a really strong aggressive queen pawn approach after d4 knight to f6 c4 floors openings were very straightforward e6 knight to c3 and now bishop to b4 the nimzo indian defense very popular on all levels, of course. And at this point, Floor played queen to c2, the classical, or sometimes called Capablanca variation. This move has become almost the main line, or perhaps I shouldn't say almost, has really become the main line of the Nimzo Indian in the last 15 or so years, surpassing e3, the, the so-called Rubenstein variation, which was for many, many years considered to be the most standard response to the Nimzo. The advantage of queen c2, although you are moving the queen at an early stage, is that you do, in most variations, avoid having double pawns. In no other variation of the Nimzo is it so common to avoid the double pawns. And this is some interesting strategic uh, side effects on the play. For one thing, then this is really kind of an afterthought, really. Um, how often in the Nimzo Indian do you ever see white castle long? By playing an early queen move, white only has to move the bishop out in order to prepare castling long, the c1 bishop that is. There is really no other variation of the Nimzo Indian where castling long is even possible. So, I think we can classify queen c2 as an extremely aggressive, although positionally correct line. One little side um, note I want to make, our fellow lecturer here at chesslecture.com, David Vigorito, has written a book, a very, very good book, I should mention, in all honesty, on the classical Nimzo Indian. It's called Challenging the Nimzo Indian, and... This book is excellent, especially for advanced intermediate players. David just does absolutely wonderful work with extensive coverage of all lines in the Queen C2 or Classical Nimzo Indian. I highly recommend it. Gave me a free copy, but he made a big mistake there because, honestly, I would have bought a copy if he hadn't given me one for free. Okay. But um, now we see... 
a branching point in this in the theory here. Many, many different possibilities. The main lines are castles D5 and C5. In particular, uh, recently, in the last year or two, D5 has really come to the fore as the main line. Players like Magnus Carlsen championing this move. Uh, here Blood played a kind of unusual move, D6. This is sort of a rarely seen line. Um, sometimes this drops a piece because of queen a4 check, but here in this particular position, black has time to play knight c6, and d5 is not on because the knight on c3 is pinned. So unlike some queen pawn games where d6 might drop the bishop on b4 here, it's safe enough. So d6, white continues classically. I mean, it's certainly possible to play e4, bishop g5, Floor prefers a very straightforward developmental approach with knight to f3. Another variation that black can play, and this would actually transpose to that, is knight to c6. This can be played instead of d6. It's a bit more common. Playing for a quick e5 with the idea of queen e7. Instead of that black castled here, I think knight c6 is a little bit more aggressive. Now a very interesting moment. It's very tempting to play bishop to g5 at this point, and it probably it's a good and standard move. The only drawback of this is that sometimes, in such setups, white has to be careful of traps like bishop takes c3, queen takes c3, knight to e4, simplifying. Now, it doesn't work right away, because after bishop takes d8, knight takes c3, white has bishop takes c7, winning material. But just keep in mind, there are positions, many, many positions, where the simplifying maneuver actually works for black. So, down the line, it may become a problem. After, say, queen e7, followed by rook to e8, the idea of bishop takes c3, followed by knight e4, simplifying is possible. Nevertheless, bishop g5 is a good and aggressive move. However, Floor decided on a different path, and... To the uninitiated, this may look like simply a passive move. But in contrast, I think it's quite an aggressive move. Bishop to d2. Now the point of this move, not only to prepare castling long, but to relieve the queen of guarding the knight on c3 against the double pawns. That keeps this queen on c2 on a very promising diagonal, the c2h7 diagonal very relevant diagonal in this position, very useful. Sometimes knight to g5 can be played with mating threats against h7. Black played a standard move preparing for e5 with queen e7. And white decided it's time, now that the bishop has relieved the queen, to kick the bishop on b4. a3, bishop takes c3, bishop takes c3. And another very nice thing about this bishop d2 idea, the bishop now on c3 potentially can be used to pressure the black king side. So white can train one or both bishops, the other bishop likely coming to d3, at the black king side. This combined with expansion on the queen side, possibly with something like b4 gives white, I think, the better chances. Now, at this point, black really should consider how to continue his preparations for e5, in my opinion. Knight c6 was probably rejected by black because of the move b4. And it's very likely that the knight on c6 will be driven away quickly. However, let's take a look. What if black plays knight c6, b4, e5? Now d5, and the knight gets kicked back, but the position remains closed. Playable for black. Or pawn takes pawn. When black can play knight takes pawn, sidestepping any threats of b5. So all in all, a playable 
possibility for black. The other possibility is knight on b to d7 preparing e5. Obviously this move has some drawbacks. It's rather passive and completely blocks in the bishop on c8. Doesn't have a lot of prospects for maneuver from d7, except possibly to f8 after the move rook to f8, or rook on f to e8. So I can see objecting to knight on b to d7, because it is rather passive, but I think it's a reasonable move. By blocking the bishop on c8, when black plays e5, they'll have to watch out for things like knight to h4, threatening knight f5. There are some concrete reasons you'd rather not block the bishop on c8. However, black played another move here, c5, which seems rather double-edged to me. I think positionally a bit dubious. Because with this move, black voluntarily allows white to open his bishop on c3. Now there's a good question as to how white should continue here. One of my students suggested a move which is very hard to refute, e4. Actually, this move is extremely logical. And white has the two bishops in space here, although his development is a bit behind with his king still in the center. The question is, how can black respond to this? I think there's only one way, actually, and that is kind of ironically to move the d pawn again with d5. I like this move. Now, if white exchanges on d5, black plays e takes d5, and black is very happy that his bishop on c8 is opened. Always remember that chess is not only about improving your pieces and increasing their scope, but limiting the scope of the opponent's pieces. So don't only think about your own pieces. Think about the opponent's pieces and what you're doing for them. By exchanging on d5, although you're making this classic exchange toward the center, which is normally correct, you're opening black's bishop on c8, which is a mistake. So white's best move is probably just to play e5 right away in this case, when black can settle his knight into e4, and we have a position that's sort of akin to a French defense. So this is probably black's best chance in the event of e4, nevertheless playable for white. Fleur decided on a clearer path here, d takes c5. This move is a bit paradoxical because we are exchanging away from the center, but at the same time, concretely opening our bishop at c3. And black definitely has some dark square weaknesses. The e5 square unprotected, d6 could be a long-term weakness. The long diagonal in general very promising for white. So d takes c5, d takes c5, and now e4. And this is very uncomfortable for black. No longer does black have the push d5. Therefore, there is no way for black's knight to gain a foothold in the center, and black's knight will be driven back. Black obviously could play e5, but the pawn is hanging to two different pieces, so it looks a little bit dubious, to say the least. He probably just loses a pawn after knight takes e5. White will have time to play f3, protect his pawn on e4, and then retract his knight to d3 or something like that in the event that it has to move. It may never, in fact, have to move. Knight takes e5 looks good. So there's no way to stop the advance e5, and white has a clear advantage out of the opening. Knight to c6, and now e5, of course. Black could play knight to g4, but this move is very time-consuming, and the knight's only prospect is to go to h6. So a little bit strange. I don't really like the move black played here. I would prefer knight d7 with the idea of rook d8 and knight to f8 to help guard h7. 
in the event of a, a later attack on h7. He played knight to e8. I think this is a very ugly move because the black rook is now blocked at f8. Suppose that black had had time to play rook to d8. He would have prevented white from castling long. At the same time, liberated the f8 square for the knight. But knight e8, very poorly placed. At best, black can place the knight on c7, where it has no future, or g6 and knight g7. Chooses another plan, which is very dangerous. Bishop d3. And black's options here are very unpleasant. h7 must be defended. I think the most solid move is h6, but in that case, white has a bayonet attack at any moment with g4, h4, a general pawn storm looks very strong for white, possibly with white castling long first. Pretty much the same holds true for g6. g4, h4, castles long in some order, followed by h5, ripping open the h-file, looks very dangerous. It's a typical situation where any pawn move you make around your king further weakens its position. So in reality, I can't really blame Samagin for playing the following move. It's possibly the lesser of the evils. F5. At first this looks like complete insanity because of the capture E takes F6, of course. White doesn't want his bishop on C3 to be blocked by a pawn on E5. But we see the point. Black recaptures with a pawn creating a strong duo of pawns in the center and protecting h7 with the queen. At first glance, it seems that black has everything under control. He controls the g5 and e5 squares, which he didn't control so well before. He defends his concrete weakness on h7. He also prepares to play e5 and create a monster outpost for his knight on c6. The final point in favor of this is black now has a really good square for his knight, which was horrible at e8. The knight at e8 can now maneuver to d6, which is a nice central position. So black's position has some, let's say, promise. If white were to play routine moves in this position, say castles, um, rook e1, things like this, he could slowly allow, allow black to consolidate. Castles is a good move. In any case, to connect the rooks. After e5, of course, opening black's bishop on c8 and preparing to create an outpost at d4, styming, styming white's bishop at c3. So a little bit of lateral thinking here for white. Keep in mind, white now really has to move fast because black is improving. He's blotted out the bishop on c3, his knight on e8 has prospects, bishop on c8 is coming out, his rooks will be connected in a few moves. White has to act fast here. Bishop e4 doesn't do anything. And knight d4 is a looming threat. So white finds a beautiful idea in this position. To open lines, number one, while he's better developed. To break black's pawn structure. Keep in mind, black has three pawn islands. White has two. That gives white superior pawn structure. If white is able to break those pawn islands up further, black's king side will be in tatters. Also, general kingside assault in mind, g4. Very strong, very timely. Pawn cannot be captured with bishop takes g4 because, of course, rook g1, pinning the bishop to the king, winning a piece. White will attack the bishop with the pawn if it's defended. So, black must simply 
find another way here, but it's not so easy. G5 threatens to tear apart Black's structure and undermine the E5 point. Black's also preparing to bring a rook to the G file, possibly play H4 as well. It also clamps down on F5, preventing Black's pawns from avalanching in the center. Black plays knight to D6. And now a, a move which really seems rather mundane in some respects, but I think very, very nice. First glance, tactical flashcard here is that, oh, we can win a pawn with bishop takes h7 check. But then you see, queen takes h7, queen takes h7, king takes h7, rook takes d6, black can in fact play bishop takes g4. And everything is in order. In fact, black may well be better here. Because it's black who now has the better pawn structure. So this d file that white has some control over is actually rather illusory. Here white makes a really nice move. We see an open d file, we have a rook on it. So I think there's a temptation to leave the rook there. But keep in mind, black may be threatening to win material here. If we make a routine move like h3, what about e4? Forking our pieces. And if we try to pin that pawn, black takes on d3, hitting our queen. So winning a piece. Perhaps rookie one is not just a good move, it's obligatory. We could play the h rook to e1. But the h rook really wants to be on g or h1, where it conducts attacking pressure on black's position. So I love this move, rook on d to e1, saying d file, although open, is strategically irrelevant here. I need a rook on e1 and I need the other rook on g1 or h1 to participate in the kingside attack. Stopping e4 cold. Now h6. The problem for black is that he cannot take on g4 at this moment. I mean, he can, but it's very, very dangerous. It simply loses material. But what can black do? Because g5, after rook on d to e1, g5 is such a huge threat. After g5, we'll undermine the e5 pawn, and black's whole position will fall apart. By playing rook e1, white is also preventing black from playing knight to d4. So all bets are off here. g5 is a gigantic positional threat. A move like which is very tempting, king to h8 may only make matters worse after g5, putting the king into the diagonal of the bishop on c3. Very dangerous. Black has nowhere to run with the king, and he plays this pathetic move h6, which weakens his king side further. On the other hand, it's hard to suggest a better move. Now, White must break through the pawns. Again, anything else is very slow. Maneuvers like knight h4 are not guaranteed to do anything. Knight h4 might be a good move, threatening a fork at g6, but once the knight lands on g6, if black avoids the fork, it's not clear what a knight would do on g6. White clearly needs more force here, so h4 pseudo-sacrifice of the pawn on g4, but nevertheless decisive. Black simply must take on g4, otherwise g5 will just overrun him completely. White's bishops raking the king's side, lines opening for the white rooks. The black king coming completely under fire with no pawn cover. So bishop takes g4 from Samagin. Of course, rook on h to g1. And now h5 simply knight to h2, threatening to win a piece with f3. Black's best chance here, I guess, is to move the king, but where? King h8 seems to put it 
on the side of the board, likely to be mated. After king h8, knight takes g4, h takes g4. This is black's probably best chance. Um, rook takes g4. White has a huge advantage, but black may be able to fight on here. At least for a while. f4 is coming in, cracking open the center. White has massive threats of queen d2, queen h6 check. But still, I think black can fight on with rook to g8. The move played in the game is equivalent to resigning. After knight h2, f5. This is crazy. King h8 is the only chance. One other point in that last variation before we go on. Indeed, if king h8, variation we looked at, just to go a little further, knight takes g4, h takes g4, rook takes g4, rook g8, contesting the file. Probably, white should avoid exchanging pieces here. If we make routine moves like rook g1, I think black might come out okay, but bishop g6, looks quite dangerous. Blocking the exchanges, preparing possibly h5 or maybe queen to e2. Threats like this. Huge advantage for white. But still black is alive. I think in the game he's finished. After f5 is essentially over. Black panicking here. f5 White wins a piece, f3. And now, queen to g7. Kind of a strange move, but... Keeping e5 protected, getting the queen off the e-line. f takes g4. And the problem is, if h takes g4, bishop takes f5 as a shot, with the idea of rook takes g4 pinning the black queen to the king. So the natural recapture doesn't work, and probably black missed that. He has to take back with a pawn. F takes g4. Now his pawn structure shattered as well. Queen e2, concretely threatening e5. And rook f4. Black loses the pawn at e5, and he's now down a piece for one pawn. Bishop takes e5. Knight takes e5. Queen takes e5. And black's pawn structure on h5 and g4 is about to melt. After queen takes e5, exchanging on e5 is bad because it would bring the white rook to e5 where it attacks h5 and undermines black's pawn structure on the king's side. Instead, Black saved his rook, hit the knight on h2, and threatened x-ray attacks against b2. Obviously, white must do something about the threat on the knight on h2. And queen takes d6, of course, is mated by the cute queen takes b2 mate. So we have rook to f2. Now rook on g to f1, a cute move, keeping in mind that the knight is hanging on h2. Queen takes e5. Rook takes e5. And the point is, if rook takes h2, rook g5 check, king h8, and white has rook f6, threatening the knight on d6, and a virtually unstoppable mate on h6. So that will be game over. Very nice and exact play. Floor not bowing down to this threat against his knight on h2. It's important to be accurate, especially when you're winning. It's such a strong tendency to let up when you're winning, and I think great players have a sense how not to do that. 
So after the exchange of queens on e5, black played instead the move knight f7. A strange position has arisen. White could capture on f2, but there's little threats like g3, rook e7. Now if rook takes h2, of course rook takes f7, no problem. Rook takes f1, knight takes f1, and the knight blockades the protected pass pawn on g3. King f8, rook e3, very solid move, keeping the knight out of e5, strengthening the blockade at g3, preparing to win the pawn at h5, protecting the bishop on d3. What a compact move. It sort of preempts rook d8, prepares knight g3, just keeps everything tight. You've got to be accurate, even a piece up. Rook d8, knight g3, and finally the black position falls apart. If he loses that h5 pawn, it's a clear piece down. Rook d7, knight takes h5, black is a clear piece down. Threats of knight f6, black resigned. A very, very nice positional attacking game from the great Salo floor. I think this highlights his style better than any other game I can think of. Queen pawn player primarily. Very, very versatile, both in positional play and, and attacking. You can see how he can attack with the two bishops. Opposite side castling in a queen pawn game, very nice. Next installment in the series, we'll see another exciting game from a great player in chess history. This is International Master William Pascal, and I thank you, one and all, for joining us here at ChessLecture.com. See you again.